Morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the Legislative Forum, sponsored by the Greater Muscatine Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Muscatine Community College. Uh, I'm Sue Johansson, and I'm filling in for Walter today. Um, I'm the rookie. Uh, be nice. <laughs> um, legislative forums take place on Saturdays in the, during the legislative session, and um, usually we run from uh, 9 to 10.30. Uh, this is an opportunity for constituents to uh, talk directly to their representatives who serve this area. The format for today is to have a legislative update from our legislators, and then we'll have round one of questions and answers. Uh, there'll be a break. Then we'll have round two of questions and answers and final comments. Uh, so we will uh, begin with the legislative update. Each legislator will have three minutes. And we'll start with you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, opportunity to be here. Um, legislative, legislative updates, I always forget which ones we had last month and which one this month. So I'll just go over some, and uh, this other gentleman here can fill in, I guess, to make, make up things that, uh, that we, we, we covered. Uh, one of the things we did last week was uh, dealing with criminal surcharges and court funds and civil fees. And there's been a number of uh, surcharges put in place over all the years. And this, this sort of put this together to make it clearer to people on what the, what the surcharges were and how are they doing that. It also uh, put some money into the, uh, the, the DCI uh, criminal lab, which is really backed up. They're backed up with rape kits that they've had there for a number of years, as well as some other things. And this puts some money into that, so hopefully they're going to be able to uh, to move some of those forward in a more of a timely manner. It also put a little bit of money, I think $370,000, into the victims assistance programs that deal with domestic violence and rape advocacy uh, uh, programs. Not advocacy, but rape uh, prevention programs. So I think that's a good thing. So it, I think this was kind of a, a decent... Uh, bipartisan uh, uh, bill that passed. Uh, Future Ready Iowa, I don't know when we did that, a couple weeks ago maybe. Uh, that, that deals with uh, trying to address, uh, address the idea of not having enough uh, trained uh, workers in the state. Uh, obviously here at Muscatine Community College in Eastern Iowa and Kirkwood, they do a lot of, a lot of training to move things forward. And, and this just sort of uh, highlights that and puts some, a little bit of money in there to, to uh, promote it and see what happens uh, to try and get more uh, skilled workforce in the state, which I think we're all interested in. A uh, couple other bills, uh, one dealing with uh, county supervisor districts. Uh, the way the bill came over from the House was they wanted to have any cities over 60,000 would be required to have supervisor districts, and those would be drawn up by the LSA the same way we draw up districts uh, at the legislative and congressional level. And then it got, it got amended, and so I think in the end, it's only districts who already have those drawn up. No, it hasn't come back. I think that with the amendment, it's just districts already have a plan three, which means they already have districts. Um, and uh, and then the LSA would, would draw, draw those up. So it, it, it just it would just deal with, I think there's 38 counties that already have districts, and those counties that don't have districts, it would not require them to draw up districts, but the ones that do have districts would be required to use LSA to draw up their plans, and they have a whole procedure on how they, how they do that. So it changed a lot from when it started. Um, <clears throat> I know in Johnson County, people were a little nervous that it would have uh, put districts in place in Johnson County, and there's not a lot of support for that but under the, under the amendment doesn't do that so that's one of the things are we running out near the end and then we had a really horrible bill called the uh, sanctuary elimination of sanctuary cities bill that I don't understand why we're doing that and why we have the need for that but otherwise glad to answer questions All right. well good morning to everyone um, as he, uh, the senator said, the Future Ready Iowa bill is a vital bill that uh, has gone through, uh, and uh, I believe the governor had a signing on it this past week, and it, uh, it's really needed here in Iowa to get number of workforce, and uh, I think it helps promote the community colleges here in the district also. So uh, we have a couple bills that 
are working their way through the house yet, and uh, I don't know where they're going to go. There's, I don't know if there's a lot of support on them. The heartbeat bill is one. Uh, the utility bill, uh, as, they are, as they are known by, uh, I know there's a little, quite a bit of discussion being going forth on it, so I don't know where that's at. Uh, I think we'll have about 10 days, two weeks of uh, session uh, left this year to get something ironed out. And uh, I don't know whether they'll make it or not. So, uh, but going forward, the, the, the biggest bill, of course, would be the, the budgets that we ha are putting together. And uh, I know they're still working on them this weekend to try and uh, get, uh, get something that uh, is good for Iowans. It'll fund the, the estates, uh, agencies, and uh, maybe, uh, and hopefully, bring a tax cut to all Iowans that uh, now that the federal government did uh, their tax uh, bill. Um, the only thing about the tax bill that we are working with uh, from the federal government, there's still estimates. And uh, that's why we're be cautious on what we do on our tax break. So uh, hopefully this week we can get back there and iron some things out and uh, bring a tax cut that is much needed in my district. Uh, people tell me that they they want uh, tax cuts, and uh, so I think that's where we're headed. The next 10 days, two weeks, and then we'll be out for the adjournment. Thank you. I'm Gary Carlson. Um, and be, before I talk a little bit about the highlight, I think we should, uh, all the audience should recognize the fact that this is going to be Senator Dvorsky's uh, last session, not just for this year, but Senator Dvorsky has served 32 years uh, in the combination of the Iowa House and the Iowa Senate, predominantly in the Senate. Um, and I have had the opportunity to work with him just for a short period of time, but I will say that he has been a huge advocate for his constituents and has been very, very willing to work on a bipartisan manner with uh, on many, many things. So I'd, I'd ask us all to give Senator Dvorsky a round of applause. <laughs> I will say he had a retirement thing, and I was kind of a, one of the few Republicans there, at least for a little bit. I was there, but I did go because uh, I, I do enjoy working with him uh, greatly. Uh, in, uh, in the House and Senate this year, we have kind of the big bills that have um, moved on and become law, and then we can answer any specific questions you have about those later. A water quality bill that we did early in, in the session, we've talked some about that in previous sessions. Mental health bill which was a very comprehensive bipartisan bill uh, just recently signed by the governor. Uh, we did some things with affordable health care plans. Uh, one of them is actually a health plan uh, that would align with federal legislation once all the rules are released regarding association plans. I'm glad to answer some questions about that later. And the other is a, uh, a non-regulated health benefit uh, plan uh, to be offered by Farm Bureau in conjunction with Wellmark um, that would be not uh, consistent with the Affordable Care Act plan but would offer some other opportunities for people to get health coverage uh, that matches up perhaps a little bit better with their families. So glad to answer any questions about that later. Um, um, both the Senator and Representative mentioned the Future Ready Iowa plan which is a significant plan for Iowans and Iowa workforce and and how we upskill uh, Iowans. And we still do have some big things to do, tax reform and uh, the budget. And they, those two are uh, very, very uh, closely linked because what you do on the tax side will affect what you have on the revenue side to be able to do the budget. The, the Senate uh, passed the tax bill first uh, in the House, we haven't done either of those because while we're looking at the Senate's version of the tax bill, we're also looking at the governor's recommendations on the tax bill. I'd say the House is more aligned with the governor on that side, which is a bit more conservative. We can uh, answer some more specific questions about that uh, as we go on. But determining what your revenue is going to be, 
is one side of the equation and turning on the other side is what revenue do you need to be able to manage the state and how do you do that responsibly and that's the balancing act. So we'll continue to do that over the next couple of weeks and we will, I'm confident that we will end up with legislation that does both. And then another uh, significant bill that is still in discussion on both sides, but I do think it, it will have the momentum to move forward, is the extension of SAVE, which is the um, one cent sales tax options for school infrastructure. Um, even though that has not expired yet, it doesn't have many years to go, and so for some school districts who may have uh, uh, looking at a new school building or a bond issue or some kind of major maintenance issue, the certainty that they will have that revenue coming in to be able to service those bonds, uh, and especially if they were doing a 20-year bond. We don't have 20 years left in save or a 10-year bond. We don't, actually, we're, we're right at the window of 10 years. So uh, I would anticipate that uh, a save bill will, will at least pass the House this year and hopefully will pass the Senate as well. So we'll just open it up for questions. I forgot, I don't know why I forgot this. The, the Senate is taking a really unusual step on Monday. Uh, we're not going to be in session. We're going to gavel in and gavel out because uh, apparently the Senate Republicans are going to uh, uh, be involved in negotiations. Now, is the House in session? I don't know how they negotiate with the House being in session. I don't, unless they'll just come over to the House or something. But, but uh, I, I, I don't know, but they said we're, we're not in session because they're involved in negotiations, and I assume the negotiations are with the governor and the and the, the, Senate, the House Republicans, so that's a very unusual step. I don't think I've ever seen that happen <coughs> before, so I, I guess they need to, if they need to do it, they need to do it, yeah, so I, maybe you'll show up and, and gavel in and out, I don't know, but, but so we'll wait to see what happens on Monday. Okay, so now we're going to move into the question and answer portion of um, today's forum. Um, the rules are that each topic will be limited to two questions unless time permits for additional questions at the end of the session. And we ask that each person that's asking a question take only one minute for your question. And we have timers. Um, Tracy and Alex are with the MCC Student Senate and there are timers this morning. And they'll give you a prompt when you have 15 seconds left. So those of you that are in line, watch Alex and, and Stacey, Tracy over here, and um, they'll help you. And then um, the legislators, we're going to try to limit your comments to two minutes. So if you'd begin, please. Okay. Good morning, and thank you for being here. My name is Stephanie Wright, and I am speaking on behalf of the MCC Young Democrats. And I would like to voice our concerns about the sudden education cuts that are proposed this year. What does the state of Iowa gain from cutting public educational spending while possibly raising tuition for non-private colleges? Since we are not like private colleges whose funding solely relies on tuition, we are concerned about the cuts because public colleges are far more diverse in programs and classes than private colleges. Everyone has an equal opportunity here to have that choice to gain a higher education. These cuts will be a disadvantage for programs, and higher tuition means more debt for students and their families. Instead of cutting educational benefits for public colleges, are there ways for the state of Iowa to save revenue in other areas? Uh, I certainly agree with your premise, and, and, and uh, I would think that we, we need to look at, it, at some of the uh, some of the tax credits that we're doing out there, that the money goes out through tax credits. We talked about that for several years now, but we've done nothing on it. So I think we ought to look at that and look at the overall budget. In theory, fiscal 19 budget, there's going to be additional funds based on the, the REC, so we'll see what happens. But I would think if there's any available additional funds, they need to go in there and not cut, uh, as you said, the public universities and public community colleges, as well as K through 12. So I certainly agree with that. Thank you. Uh, I, I believe I agree with the senator. We uh, are looking at some tax credits uh, throughout the budget year here coming. Um, you know, the cuts are not easy. It's not easy on any of us up here to uh, say we need to deappropriate uh, a university or whatever. But. Uh, to be financial or f fiscally 
responsible. Some things have to happen in the universities. Uh, I think they could handle the uh, cuts that are being put forward. When you add in money that's uh, given to the universities through RIF, the program for funding of their buildings and different parts, this is just a small cut that they should be able to absorb on a, on a fairly easy uh, uh, method that to cut it. I don't agree that, I think they could f absorb these cuts and not raise tuitions, but uh, that's a, what the regents are there for and they'll make the right decisions on uh, what going forward. So, uh, not easy, uh, uh, finding that out. So, uh, hopefully in the future budgets, it will not happen. So, uh, I look forward to better times coming. Thank you. So, the, the change that we did this year was a deep appropriation for fiscal year 2018. So, the budget has not been set for fiscal year 2019. That's the work still being done. So, in the bill that the Senate passed for deappropriations was um, far bigger reductions across the board and most specifically to the regents and the community colleges than the House was comfortable with and as we continue to have some negotiations with the Senate and what was ultimately passed was a significant reduction that now the Regents universities but exclusively University of Iowa and Iowa State were a reduction of 10 million dollars so what is that that's a reduction from what we had allocated in the in the previous year to them on about a 570 million dollar budget in addition to what we do on RIF and tuition replacement, which is how buildings are essentially funded. Um, in the community colleges, we felt like the community colleges have a more difficult time being able to recover the dollars for them, and we made a reduction that ended up at $500,000 across all of the community colleges of Iowa. And I think uh, having talked to many of the community college uh, presidents as well as the as the staff that calls on well nobody's ever pleased with a reduction the five hundred thousand dollar reduction was seen as one that they could they could manage through so I would agree with the senator that at least in preliminary budgets offered up by the governor there's an increase in education in predominantly in community colleges and I think future ready Iowa uh, a lot of that is really aimed with the community colleges being a very very significant partner uh, because of both what they offer on the uh, skilled trades side as well as the academic uh, preparation. So we'll, I, I believe that we will, we will look at all those budget issues prudently and for fiscal year 19. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dan Yoakum from here in Muscatine. And uh, <coughs> thank you for your service. I, I appreciate how difficult it is when you have different opinions and everything coming together. You have to work these things out to establish the laws and stuff. Uh, but it seems like the revenue estimating group hasn't been too good. It's, it's kind of a pattern that we never have what they say we're going to have, and then you end up having to cut and whatnot. Uh, and so now you read the newsletters from the different groups and stuff, and it's kind of like the sky is falling. Oh, they're going to cut us. It's the end of the world, you know. At the same time, it seems like over the years, it's the same issues that are always coming forward. Um, so my question is, I kind of forget where we are now. Do you personally see a solution to where we get good, efficient government without breaking the bank? Well, you got a couple of questions in there, Dan. The one on the revenue estimating conference, and I'm probably a little bit more generous in my attitude towards them. Uh, having worked trying to also establish budgets for businesses and predict out 18 months, 24 months of where you're going to be. So this year we ended up making, needing to make a reduction around $35 million. But remember that's $35 million on $7.2 billion budget. That's really not a huge margin of error estimate. Uh, and there are a number of things that drive you know, those kinds of changes. I, I think one of them, and because it, it's the second largest tax revenue issue for what generates taxes or revenue for the state, is sales tax. And that has been a really difficult one to predict because of 
buying pattern changes of Iowans and all people across the nation, uh, more and more online buying over the internet. And depending on whom you buy from on the internet, sometimes sales tax is collected. So if you buy from Walmart.com, for instance, you pay Iowa sales tax because Walmart has operations in Iowa. Uh, so that's what they refer to as when they say they have nexus in Iowa. But if you order from a number of other websites who maybe only do business with people through the internet, they don't have physical locations in Iowa, they don't have nexus, it's optional whether or not they charge sales tax and collect it and then remit it. And the vast majority do not. Iowans, by law, are supposed to keep track of what they buy on the internet and don't pay sales tax and then remit it. And you know that that really doesn't happen, and that's a big part of the, of the miss. And we can talk about it later with another question, but they've courteously told me I'm, my time's out. As I said earlier, the, uh, we work with estimates, and estimates can get me in trouble on my own uh, personal finances once in a while. If I, on my farm, if I estimate I'm going to have so many bushels harvest for grain price, it's so estimate and neither one of those happen or both don't happen, now I'm, I'm in trouble. And that's what we're finding here in the state is uh, a 2% error in uh, estimates is uh, billions of dollars here in the state. And the federal government's tax cuts that I just mentioned, if those are wrong or don't come in close, then our estimate of what we're going to have is off. So, uh, but that's the only way, that's the only method we have right now is to estimate. and. Uh, as Gary mentioned the, uh, here in his statements about uh, collecting taxes off the internet and how that has affected the economy. Uh, I've always said uh, since I got elected that there's nothing in that we can't do if we have a good economy. You know, our estimates will be better and if they're off then it won't be so vital but it's been, it's been vital to have better estimates this past couple years. So. I'm, I'm optimistic about a better economy here in Iowa and uh, more funds coming in, more money, tax money, and uh, that let, I see better days for the uh, state of Iowa. Uh, first of all, I, th I think the cut of $10 million in this current fiscal year through the regions was unconscionable. I mean, despite having big budgets, we've got two months left in the fiscal year and cutting $10 million, way, way, way too much and to do it just for Iowa State and University of Iowa, I think that's crazy. I think that really is out of line with what they could have done and anything else. We didn't touch, as they said, any tax credits. All we do is talk about that. We don't do anything about it. Everybody else got lots of cuts. The, the, uh, the uh, corrections department had $3 million cut. I have no idea how they're gonna take care of that. That was way off the charts too. So we gotta make better decisions how we do these things and move those things forward. So, okay, so that's, not what your question was, but that's sort of the current budgeting situation. Having been the appropriations chair for a long time, there's certainly a lot of things we need to change in Des Moines. One of the things is we don't really look at anything other than general fund, and that makes no sense. There's all kinds of other funds out there and everything else, we need to look at those. So the state budgets are like 7.2, 7.3 billion dollars. We also get about six billion dollars from the feds. And a lot of that's going away, so we need to check on that. And those together make up what we're spending at the state level. So we don't, rarely do we check on the, any of the federal budgeting. So we need to look at that. We also certainly need to look at these tax, tax uh, credits and all these things too. And we don't really look at that. We just look at that sort of, there's, there's one committee that's supposed to look at it, but it's not part of the whole appropriation process. So the way we sort of look at all appropriations really does need to be changed. And I don't know if you need to change the structure of the revenue estimating conference or not, but I think the Department of Revenue has completely mishandled uh, the one situation where we're uh, consumables, which was put in place a few years ago by the governor who actually did it, did it under administrative rule, which wasn't really allowed, but somehow got through. Uh, maybe the idea, I think the idea is probably good. Combustibles are sort of inputs that you, right, Gary can, talk about this, inputs they use in manufacturing, right? And those had been taxed. We took the tax off that, Department of Revenue came in and estimated like 25 million. You know how much it was? 95. 
I mean, so, you know, that kind of thing, you can't budget, you know, no wonder they're way off because the Department of Revenue is way off in that situation. So we either need to get somebody better in the Department of Revenue to estimate those things or stop sort of, you know, hiding the ball and pretending that it's going to be a lot less than it was. So that's one of the big things the last two or three years that that was way off. So we need to, we need to look at the Department of Revenue and need to get people in place there to give you honest, straightforward answers. That's one of the things as well as looking at the entire system. Too much Renola Probst person. My name is Brandi Olson. I'm a Muscatine resident. I'm also director of legal and regulatory services at your municipal utility, Muscatine Power and Water. On behalf of MPW, we extend our sincerest thanks to Representative Carlson and Senator Lofgren for their work with us over the past few years to address some of our recruiting and pension concerns with the passage of, of HF 2379. Um, we also thank the rest of you that voted in support of the bill. And while MPW does have a strong pension, being one of the last municipal utilities to have its own pension does have its downsides. We've struggled to attract candidates with public sector experience and with the passage of this bill starting July 1st, new hires will have the, uh, with prior IPERS experience, will now have the option to continue in IPERS. There were also some technical corrections to investment authority and some other changes included in the bill that will help the municipal utilities in the long run. Um, these two spent considerable amount of time listening to our concerns over the last few years, helping us to craft legislation that would address our needs, and then they put in the work at the Capitol to get the bill passed in both the House and the Senate. I think one of the things that goes underestimated is the amount of work it takes to get uh, a kernel of an idea into a bill, work with the agencies who have input on that, on those, uh, in those areas, and then actually get it through <laughs> uh, both chambers. So thanks again for listening to your constituents, helping us to get access to the right folks in Des Moines to address our issue and for your leadership on the bill. Um, I would, I, my one question uh, besides the thank you is uh, I'd like to hear more about your position on the omnibus energy bill. Uh, and neglected to mention that uh, uh, Senator Lofgren wanted me to let, him, let everyone know uh, uh, that uh, why he's not here. And he, he gave me sort of a flimsy excuse, his daughter's getting married today. So that, that's why, why he's not here. So he, he wanted to let everybody know that that's the reason he wasn't here today. So uh, The energy efficiency bill is being one of those old guys who was actually involved in 1990 in passing the energy efficiency bill. It's worked really well for years and years. I don't know why we're going in there and trying to change it. I, I really don't. Or, or to, to the, the vast amount we're changing it. I mean, if you want to tinker with it, maybe update it or something, I th think that would make sense. But the energy efficiency bill actually has worked. If you think about 1990, think how about inefficient everything was, appliances and everything else, till, t till this date now, uh, how things have changed and how we're moving forward with those sort of things. And the bill actually worked, but maybe there's something we should have done to to update it, but, but to get rid of the whole bill, I, I, I don't see how that makes sense for anyone. Well, uh, just a comment on uh, the IPERS and the retirement. Uh, I know how much work this guy puts in on the bills that he's involved in, and uh, he's a good representative for the district here. And uh, this energy bill, I have concerns about it also. Uh, for the eminent domain part of the bill. Uh, and I've expressed them to Representative Carlson and uh, we've, we're still talking things out. There's other representatives that have questions on it. And uh, I'm finding out through some emails that some people don't realize that in their energy bill, uh, they are actually paying for the uh, energy part of it. and. Uh, because they don't see it on their bill. It used to be on the bill, they tell me, years ago, and now it's a more or less a hidden fee that everybody pays into on this. So uh, it has some ways to go yet on it. Uh, I see both sides of the story on the bill for uh, people that uh, think it's going to increase their uh, bill dramatically or have no restraints uh, put on it that uh, utilities can just up their uh, fees that they charge. So uh, that's one of these bills that I said we'll have to work through this week and hopefully uh, come up with a solution 
that is uh, will work for all Iowans because it does affect all Iowans. Uh, so, and uh, Representative Carlson can fill you on in on every aspect of this bill. Well, thanks, Brandy. Uh, I'm the floor manager for that bill, and, and omnibus is a good title for it because it is all encompassing. So it deals with a variety of things, and uh, Representative Kerr and Senator Dvorsky talked a little bit on energy efficiency. And it's right, it has been around since 1990. When it was first put in place in 1990, 2% of your electric energy bill went into energy efficiency, and 1.5% of your natural gas bill went into energy efficiency. So every month your bill has that had and back in 1990 and for many years after that, had that additional fee put on your bill. By the legislature did pass language that that would not show up on your invoice. Okay, so it is built as a rider that goes on top of the tariffs uh, for the companies to collect. Municipal utilities and RECs have a little bit more flexibility in how they do it, although they still must have energy efficiency programs. There's a lot more regulation on the rate-regulated uh, energy companies, which is predominantly Alliant and Mid-American. There's also Black Hills Energy, which is not in this part of the state. It's a natural gas provider. Over the years, so that's how it started in 1990. In 1996, the cap was removed, uh, but it still stayed in about that range for several years after that. What's really brought it to light in the last several years, that rate has increased dramatically to the point that the average in the rate regulated market, so Alliance market, Mid America market, it's now up to six to seven percent of your energy bill is going into energy efficiency programs. So when you think about if you buy a furnace and you get a rebate, or if you you know, to add some insulation and maybe there's a rebate or whatever. All of those rebates, they are not funded by the energy companies. Those are all funded by the additional charge that you are paying on your energy bill and then that money is being then redistributed back out to people with rebates. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we're dealing with. It's a large bill. Uh, and I'm glad to ask, answer some more questions or talk to anybody about it. But that's one of the issues is should we put a, a, a cap again and get it back more so it's not costing Iowans quite as much for that, but still keep energy efficiency programs alive. What was passed in the Senate is not an acceptable bill from the House's perspective. And there is a dramatic changes in amendments to do that. And I'm working with some uh, Democrats as well in the House, and I think we're we're working on a pathway uh, for a bill that is a more balanced portfolio, okay? And I can see I have to represent, work with Representative Kerr a little bit more on an issue that, that dealt with, with eminent domain because I believe we've re resolved that issue as well. Sure. Okay. Um, for those of you in line, we'll have you recreate the line in just a little bit. We're gonna take a break. And uh, before we take the break, um, I'd like to welcome MCC President Naomi DeWinter up to the front. And we'll go from there. Good Hi. Hi. So on behalf of Muscatine Community College, faculty, staff, and students, I thank you for your service to our community. We especially want to lift up Senator Dworsky today uh, we understand this is your last time in this capacity being here. You've been a strong advocate for higher education specifically. I see by the logo on your shirt, I've never seen you without wearing a University of Iowa something. Um, and there's probably black and gold in your veins uh, as well. But you've also shown a great interest in what we do here at Muscatine Community College, the Communities College, and I thank you for that. Um, John DeBeat, my colleague who is the advisor for the Young Democrats, would also like to address you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, 
basically, um, as uh, my president, uh, Dr. De Winter, mentioned, you know, I work at MCC. I'm the MCC Young Democrats advisor here. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Senator Dvorsky for being very supportive of public education and community colleges. Thank you for your, for your years of service and for your selfless service to the people of Iowa. Thank you for supporting all of us for many years, and I'm proud to call you my friend. Today, we and the state of Iowa celebrate you and your service, Senator. Thank you for everything. At this point, I would like to call on MCC Young Democrats President Elizabeth. Hello and good morning. My name is Elizabeth Agapito and I am the president of the Young Democrats here at the Community College. And I would just like to acknowledge Senator Dvorsky for having us, thank you so much for having us. Um, on Tuesday, April 3rd, we went to the Capitol and we learned and experienced so much and it's all for your support and thank you so much um, for supporting our college and the student education. I would like to present this plaque to Senator Robert Dvorsky in appreciation for your years of service at the Iowa State Senate and for being a champion for public education. Thank you so much. round two and once again the questions questioners will get one minute and um, legislators will get two uh, my name is Ann Hetzler I'm a Muscatine resident and uh, um, board member for clean air Muscatine and my question relates to the last one in a way but it's a little different it's regarding Senate file 2311 and um, talking about utility funding for energy efficiency the one thing that concerns me is that there may be fees for uh, solar customers. And I, I think that solar energy is a great alternative and we should encourage it and make it available to as many people as possible and rather than penalizing people for having it. And I just would appreciate any comments you have. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Uh, I think we need to talk to Representative Carlson though because I think the changes over in the House should really benefit the bill, sounds like it. I know early that when the, uh, it came over to the house that uh, I was contacted by a lot of the farm, uh, not farm groups, but individual farmers that had solar on the various buildings and everything. And uh, I think that uh, there's been enough changes to it that it's uh, it's been uh, accepted that the language in the bill for solar now is adequate and uh, protects everything. I think uh, Representative Carlson, co correct me, uh, everything that is going to be grandfathered in that is in place now and looking forward, uh, there's going to be just a, a minor uh, change as far as solar is. Yeah, protection is always in the eyes of the beholder. Okay, so. Uh, the original bill that was introduced, I think, probably would have been dangerous to the solar industry, and that was stripped out of the bill, even in, on the Senate side, before it came over the House. There's still some concerns in there about solar. Um, so when somebody makes a decision about installing solar today, there's a federal tax credit. We talk about tax credits, right? There's a federal tax credit. There is a state tax credit. And then on the actual invoice there, it, uh, or, or when you get, when you produce solar and you sell it then to the, to the grid, uh, to the utility company, the credit that you get for that, and then if you create excess over what your peak usage is. So there's some language still in the bill uh, of how that works. And solar has developed over time. So the federal tax credit is still in place. He has a sunset, I think it's 2028, but it still has it there. The state tax credit is still in place, although I will say the Senate tax bill uh, 
had some language in there about solar credits. I'm not on that tax bill, but we need to continue to take a look at that. Uh, because when we talk about tax credits being sometimes evil, but they're not always evil if you're trying to spur on certain, certain industries. Then there's the, the other issue is about uh, participation in energy efficiency. And that is in the bill so, still uh, that's being proposed. I mean, it's not passed legislation yet. But so every rate payer pays in energy efficiency, but solar customers have been exempt from some of that in some areas. And so what the bill is talking about now is that effective January 1, 2019, for solar installations that take place after that date, that they will also pay into energy efficiency. So if it's good for all ratepayers, it's really good for all ratepayers. But for people who installed solar, solar prior to that, they did it based on you know, what the regs were at that time when they made their, their determination to make that capital investment and made their return on investment calculations that we have grandfathered them in so that they will not be impacted by that. So that's where we are as of right now. It's not legislation yet, okay? Right. But that's at least what is in my amendments on the bill today on solar. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to add to that, I, in my district, uh, just south of Columbus Junction, there's a, a company that is big into solar. They set it up for various towns, farmers, uh, all across the United States. And when the, f the Senate bill came out, they were very concerned about uh, what it would do to the solar industry and to their businesses. And since the uh, changes have been made, uh, they're very happy with what is going on with it. So uh, if they're happy about it and can live with it, I think we, it's a good language. It's in the bill. Uh, I just one, one brief comment on this. Uh, people said I bleed black and gold. Well, one of the main black and gold people in the state uh, is out uh, promoting solar, uh, Tim Dwight. He's probably the biggest uh, solar promoter in, in Iowa, and if you remember him, he played for the Hawkeyes and played in NFL. So he's out uh, really going around the state and really been uh, quite a force to, to, to do that. The solar arrays are just all over now. If you If you go... It's just outside my district, I think. If you, if you go on 38 North here, just outside Wilton, there's a big solar array going on there, and that's the REC. So it's, it's, it's amazing how it's grown, and I think we, we don't want to put a crimp in that. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yes, first, thank you for the coffee. It's great. <laughs> um, I, Carrie Gruenhagen, we farm in Scott and Muscatine County. Well, my wife sells women's self-defense products, so thank you for the recent stun gun legislation that clarifies that law. It's been a lot of confusion over it. Um, also, as uh, small business owners, the ACA was devastating to us, so thank you for the health care plan legislation. Uh, could you talk about uh, tax reform, uh, in particular Section 179 updates and the beginning farmer tax credit and the corporate tax rate, which is the highest in the nation, at 12 percent, please? Uh, the bill that passed the the Senate is, is just was just way out there, and I, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. So I guess I just kind of defer to the guys from the House here because the one that passed the Senate was way beyond any reasonable bill that's out there. So hopefully the the House is going to do something different. I agree. Hopefully we'll do something different. Uh, as as we mentioned earlier, uh, here we're still working on this, but 179. The governor had her proposal out to, uh, I think, go up to 400000 or something on that order. I, I like that. Uh, as a farmer, I th it's much needed and promote uh, a lot of good things in the, in the, for businesses in general, uh, whatever your uh, business is. Um, whether we get there or not, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm very hopeful and uh, looking forward to... Uh, using her numbers on that uh, 179. Uh, beginning farmer loan, uh, a year or so ago there was a beginning farmer loan and uh, custom farming uh, had a tax credit. I think you're gonna see that this is what I've been finding out and talking. The, the uh, tax credit for custom farming I believe is going to go away. And 
right now the beginning farmer loan is around six million. Hopefully we can up that to around eight. And uh, it, that, that is much needed too in, in uh, getting young farmers uh, involved in farming and, and get them set up since uh, we're all getting older in the farming industry. And uh, so I, I'm optimistic on both of them. Uh, I just can't. I'd love to be able to stand here today and say, we, we've got it. It's going to be in the bill, but just where it lands is, is another thing. So, yeah. So 179. For some of you who may not be familiar with that, that has to do with the with accelerated depreciation and how the federal government takes it versus how the state of Iowa takes that. And so you still get depreciation, but it but it's over the life of the asset versus accelerating it. Federal government allows for accelerated depreciation, and in the past they always pass it towards the end of a fiscal year, and then if they were going to have it or not at Iowa, then we had to pass a separate bill each year to couple with the federal government on that. We did not couple uh, a couple of years ago uh, because of the expense to be able to do that. So it was around 80 to $85 million a year to couple. It's not that you don't get it over time, it's just that it accelerates it. So kind of the, a, a middle ground is what uh, Representative Kerr talked about is raising the caps. And I believe the last number I heard that that should, that should work for almost 90% of the people who take sections 179 now. So it helps uh, a, a large percentage. And, and it's oftentimes referred to as to help farmers. And it does because they make a lot of large um, high capital equipment purchases. But it's really, it's not limited to agriculture. So you know, machine shops that order CNC machines. There's a lot of small businesses that the 179. So it, it, it's uh, sometimes mischaracterized that it's just exclusively for farmers. It is not. It is depreciation on assets. Um, so I think a cap probably will be the, the step forward. That's the best I can see now in the <laughs> conversation. And I'm not on the tax bill. I'm on the periphery of the tax bill because I like the kibitz on it. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on that committee. Uh, corporate tax rate, the governor's proposal didn't have corporate tax rate. I, I, I just got to answer to right that part of it. Uh, the corporate tax rate was not in that. The Senate had it. It is difficult to always sort out what exactly is corporate tax rate because the way a lot of people's tax structures are, whether LLCs or S-Corps, and so is that a corporate rate or is that a personal rate? Uh, we may have to have some corporate rate to be able to deal with that, but I think more than likely corporate tax rates is looked at, maybe we'll look at next year when we have a little bit better understanding of the impacts of the federal. I'm Linda Kelty, retired teacher from the Muscatine Schools. Um, Iowa has a rich history of being an educational leader in our nation. Senate Study Bill 3206, introducing vouchers, undermines our legacy. It hasn't worked in the states who have tried it, and there's quite a bit of research out there if you're interested. Will you support or oppose this bill or any other writers on other bills that would put Iowa in a on a voucher system and why? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear exactly what you said. What Senate bill what and what was the subject again? I'm Senate sorry. Senate Study Bill 3206. I, I'm sorry, I'm, that's a Senate bill and a study bill, and I'm not familiar with the bill, so I, I don't really know what the language is on that bill. I don't know what it does. If it's a study bill, unless it's in Ways and Means and Appropriations, it's probably dead for the year. But maybe the Senator Vorsky can address that. It's a Ways and Means bill, so then it's not dead. So okay. I guess I, I don't know the, the details of that bill. I can't really give you an honest answer one way or the other. Well, can then, then may I ask, um, with your connections and the people that you encounter. I, I want to know if our representation supports or does not support voucher systems, whether it comes up at this point or not, because I see it as being so deleterious for our state. Okay, so the House did have a voucher bill that they looked at earlier this year and did not advance that bill, did not believe there was enough support for that bill. Okay. So I'm not sure exactly where it stays with the Senate. So I, I don't think in this time and place that uh, where we are in the state budgets and the funding that we've got for public education today, I don't see emphasis, I don't see support today for, um, 
for a voucher bill at this point. I, I just, I don't, I think until we feel better about what funding we have for K-12, I don't think that'll be an option. I do know that there are many, many people that would like the dollars to follow the child and be, and be able to have people uh, make those choices on where those dollars go, but I think at this point, there's probably not support to pass that. Thank you. Yes, I believe, I heard uh, uh, Representative Rogers, uh, who's on the Education Committee in the House the other day say, if we couldn't get enough votes to pass our own uh, Senate bill, uh, I wouldn't anticipate it moving at all. So, uh, and I, 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 uh, I believe we have a need to get some vouchers to a certain uh, bunch of kids that that need to, that are falling on the wayside. I'd like to see some way we could help them get their education because one way out of poverty is education. And if we keep failing these kids and letting them drop off, they're not going to be. Uh, productive in, in their lives, they're not going to be productive for their families, and how can we do that? I'd, I'd like to be able to work and find out what can we do for this certain amount of kids, and, and I don't know how many they are in the state, to tell you the truth, but, but we could call them dropouts. We could call them underachievers, whatever name you'd want to put on them, and get them steered in the right direction, but it's going to take money. We all, that's, that's the bottom line in this argument is where's, Where's the money go? But I, I'd like to see it be able to do something to encourage more education, whether that be a parochial school or a Christian school. If they would thrive somewhere else, I think they need a little help. And maybe they can't get it from home. Uh, that's where I'm at on this. Uh, I'd like to, like to be able to see everyone get an education and uh, improve their lives and improve their status in life. We need workers. We need educated workers here in the state of Iowa with the uh, percentage of workforce that we are down to the bare bones, basically, and number of workforce that are available. So uh, I, it's dead. I, I'd say it's not going anywhere or going to be attached to anything. Okay. I'm afraid I'm a K through 12 public education purist and I never vote for any of these kind of bills. Um, and I haven't for years on any of the other things. And because I think it under, really undercuts public education. And as Representative Carlson said this year, we haven't been very generous to public K through 12 education this year. 1% of all the growth and, and really trying to cut back on all sorts of other things. So I don't think the timing's good for that. There's lots of reasons not to do it. Having said that, the Senate, uh, Republicans will probably pass out something because because they're determined to do this is the most conservative group of people together as a group I've ever seen in the Iowa legislature in, in, in the Senate Republican group not necessarily individually but together as a group they are really really conservative and way outside the bounds of, uh, of I, I think of uh, most people in the state so they're going to pass all kinds of stuff that's not hopefully not going to go anywhere in the Iowa House so I think this is an example of that Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shelley Servadillo. I'm a registered nurse and a veteran of the United States Army for School 4. Put this down a second. Here. So um, I handed you guys a little handout. Um, it's regarding Senate File 2398. It's industrial hemp. Um, it's been read, uh, I believe, this week. It was read in the House of Representatives. It passed unanimously in the Senate. Uh, so what I would like to ask is that in the House of Representatives that you guys will support it and vote yes. Uh, and I did give you guys some education on your handout that there's a difference between cannabidiol and uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabidiol. Um, I really want you guys to understand that industrial hemp growing in the field is not psychoactive. It is not marijuana <laughs> with THC. And, um, and then also I want you guys to understand that in our state we have what's called a cannabidiol Act, but what we really should be doing is framing this appropriately. Our goal is to give people cannabis with THC that is medicine. Cannabidiol itself, all by itself as a molecule, CBD, is not psychoactive, and under federal scheduling guidelines, it doesn't meet criteria to be a Schedule One substance, and we should be reframing this and actually giving the people of Iowa THC. Um, that is the medicine, and that's what meets scheduling criteria. I gave you a handout. Um, <laughs> K 
cannabidiol, CBD, is not THC, and, and we really need to stop conflating this issue. Industrial hemp deserves to be in its own law and, and be grown by Iowa farmers, and they deserve a chance uh, to cash in on this. And so whatever law that we pass for industrial hemp, uh, it should not be, um, there's a medical cannabidiol um, crossed out in that law and that when it was sent for you from the Senate, but the CBD oil that's sold as retail is not pharmaceutical grade. It's, it doesn't contain THC, and, it, um, and throughout our state and in other states under the Farm Bill, uh, it's, it's sold as an oil, and you can buy it off Amazon. And in our state, we're trying to regulate it to the point that it's going through the Iowa Department of Health, and we're calling it medical cannabidiol. And that's actually a grave misnomer, and in our state, we have completely confused this issue. So what I, I would ask that, gentlemen, that um, you learn your facts. I've, I've given you the... Here it is, chemistry lesson. Um, so please support SF 2398, but don't pass a law that, again, will be in um, limiting Iowa's farmers for being able to have the ability to actually make money off this crop. It has many purposes, as I've outlined for you um, and, and what I wrote on the back of this. So thank you so much, and please support Senate File 2398 when you see it in the House of Representatives. And if you can't, do suspend the rules, pull it out from Linda Upmeyer's butt, and, and take a vote, gentlemen. Have some some guts. Don't don't fart. Don't vote party over people. Thank you. Well, as you notice, it passed unanimously in the Iowa Senate, and uh, that I think that's a tribute to uh, Senator Kenny, who's been working on this bill for two or three years, as well as Senator Shipley, who, who dealt with the bill on the floor. He actually had brought some uh, demonstrations of what industrial hemp can do, and some actual fibers and things here. And this story of industrial hemp is fascinating. Uh, apparently. Henry Ford actually built a car out of out of uh, industrial hemp yes, sir. and some other things and, and all these things, all the uses and everything. I'm just amazed that we haven't been dealing with it other than this sort of reefer madness craziness that people keep talking about. And I don't know if they purposely do that to, to try to, uh, to muddy the waters or, or you know what what the story is. So this has nothing to do with uh, marijuana or uh, cannabinoid. The other thing, in fact, is I understand it. If you start growing industrial hemp, that if somebody's growing marijuana in there, that pollutes that and kills the marijuana, right? Yeah, yes. It, it will, if so, they try to cross pollinate, no, yeah, no THC will pollinate. be a bill. Yeah, it won't work. Right. Um, so if you get industrial hemp out there, you might use that as law enforcement, I guess. Grow a lot of industrial hemp in it if you know where there's some marijuana being grown. Uh, so anyway. CBD is an antagonist to THC. So um, there's so much CBD in these plants. If you tried to smoke it, CBD binds in the body right. uh, and blocks the receptor for THC. So nobody could actually get high if they smoked industrial hemp. It's physically pathophysiologically, um, it's impossible. It doesn't happen. So all this requires, I think, is a study to start looking for. for the Farm Bill sets that up. Anything yeah. is a... Um, yeah. So yes, anyway, I think this sets out a study to move forward on it, and I think that's a good first step, and that the, the House should pass it. Thank you. I don't, I'm not really familiar with this at all, to tell you the truth. I know uh, we talked about it a year ago, uh, where first steps, and th this uh, sounds like the next step forward for Thank the state you. of Iowa uh, in bringing pain relief and uh, helping. Oh, that doesn't have the pain relief in it. That's right. Uh, flip it over so and look at the back. I, I listed the, what these oh, okay. molecules can do, sir. But anyhow, uh, I'm not sure where, if this is going to go anywhere at all in the house this year. To tell you the truth, uh, haven't heard much about it, talk about it. Uh, you'll see it this week in the House, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll see how far it goes. So uh, I'll do a little studying on it this weekend and uh, next week before it hits the uh, floor to be voted on. Thank you for Thank your you so information. Much, sir. Thank you. Thanks. I, I read the industrial hemp bill, and it probably does a disservice to the bill to, to co-mix the subjects because they are separately, they're separate subjects, and so uh, I, I would say the argument to support industrial hemp should should be devoid of conversation about uh, cannabis oil. Um, the idea of industrial hemp is is it another crop that Iowa agriculture could be introduced? Is it also a crop that could be part of some of the clean water areas? Is it a crop that could be grown along some of the streams uh, as well? And so there is some there's some interest. You know, hemp. Industrial hemp was a pretty popular crop in the United States many, many years ago. Um, and then there were laws against it. Uh, and then quite candidly, a lot of it got replaced by petrochemicals. So 
uh, where it was used in fibers for manufacturing clothes, that was replaced by petrochemical resins, and so then it really became out of favor because of the cost constraints. So there is some uh, revitalization of the industrial hemp market today. Uh, if you read the back of what I gave you, it talks about the ability of the hemp plant and phytoremediation. Yeah, I'm not really reading all your stuff while we're doing yes, stuff sir. here, Shelly. Thank, Thank you. Uh, I'm a resident of, um, I'm Roger Landy, I'm a resident of Muscatine, and I have a couple of uh, general questions I'd like to have the uh, panel uh, respond to. Uh, I don't know where the legislature stands on the backfill in the uh, taxes uh, uh, which were reduced for business property some years back and there was an implicit promise that uh, it was gonna be uh, backfilled in the later years but uh, then they got in a debate about who made the promises and when, and uh, I don't know where that stands now. I'd like to un understand that. I got a little information from Representative Kerr about uh, the uh, uh, dram shop legislation, which I understand has been passed by the Senate, and, and uh, or passed by the House, and uh, sent to the uh, Senate for consideration, is that correct? I think Dram Shop's been passed by the Senate as well and sent to the governor. Pardon? Dram Shop has been passed by the Senate as well and sent to the governor. Oh, okay, all right. The, uh, uh, the other thing is uh, one of the largest problems we seem to be facing uh, nationally and especially in Iowa is with Medicaid and its related problems. And the legislation now that we have before us where uh, is uh, suggesting that uh, with uh, using uh, Blue Cross Farm Bureau mechanisms, they would uh, have an alternate method that would, uh, as I understand it, uh, uh, preclude coverage of pre-existing conditions, which seems to me to be a backward step and uh, I don't know, you know the, the fact that it's maybe cheaper to do that is not a reason. I think it, uh, it's wrong-headed legislation, I believe. Well, Roger, um, two complex subjects. I'll try to address them. First, on the com commercial property backfill. That is one of the things under consideration of beginning to reduce that backfill. The logic of that backfill was when commercial property rates, as most of you know, were assessed at 100% of assessed value, when they reduced to 90% of assessed value, that would have reduced revenue at the local city and county government. So the state passed legislation to backfill that difference, but the idea was that there would be growth. Today, we are seeing most cities and counties, if you look at the base year of when that was reduced, that their assessed values today are anywhere from a from 105 to 125 percent of where that is, so there has been that recovery. It's not the case with every city, not the case with every county. So there is a there is discussion. There hasn't been any legislation passed yet, but there is discussion as part of looking at overall tax reform and overall budget as to how that is dealt with. It's about 150 million dollars a year that the state is sending back to the cities and the counties. And in many cases, those cities and counties have more than recovered from where it was before that reform. So is it really doubling up on, on the dollars? Regarding, uh, you mentioned Medicaid, but Medicaid and the issue of the health benefit plans with uh, Farm Bureau and Wellmark, and they, they are com two completely different issues. Medicaid is Iowa's, and, and federal government in conjunction with Iowa, the welfare plan that provides health benefits for people at lower incomes. What the legislation passed regarding a health benefit plan was for those people who are purchasing health insurance on the marketplace and where their options are of what they can buy. 
So uh, with the Affordable Care Act, there's been a dramatic decline in carriers offering health insurance for people to be able to purchase. Many people get their health insurance to their employer, but self-insured or self-employed people don't have that option. So uh, we have increasing amount of testimony of people on a regular basis to now that because their income is above where they can get credits against the premiums on the exchange, so they have to pay the full cost of that insurance coverage and everything that is is defined as must be covered in the Affordable Care Act. And so uh, we've had repeated people coming and pleading for us to do something because they are be their premiums are twenty to $25,000 a year for health insurance for their family with a large deductible. And so this plan, and I can talk to you about it afterwards, but I couldn't, dis I couldn't disagree with you more, Roger, that this is something that has to be done to to allow people to have health coverage. The backfill, when this discussion started coming forth, I had to go find somebody who had been there for a day or two uh, to find out some history on, on the backfill. And, and what I found out that, you know, the, the Senate con was controlled by the Democrats back in 2014, and the House had the Republicans. So to get this accomplished, there had to be a uh, compromise on whether, and the uh, way I've been told by some that's been there, that that, that discussion on should we have a sunset on it or sh we should we not? Well, the uh, compromise, well, 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 we won't. And, but now we are both, like the Representative Carlson says, I think in my district there is one uh, and I, I'm not sure whether it's the city of Wapalo, it's at 95% of where they were in 14. Fast forward that on to today, I think you're going to, I'm not sure you're going to see an a elimination of the backfill for 19. Uh, I think maybe 20, but I think you're going to find that it, it is a, maybe a small increment, that it's not going to be a big total cut at one swipe of, the, of a knife. I think you're going to see them gradually falling off. And uh, uh, like uh, Representative Carlson said, there are some uh, cities and counties that are, have gone way beyond what they were in 14, up to 140, 46%, I think one of them was. So it's it probably time to start weaning, as you want to say, of this. So uh, and I got my times up. but. Uh, Representative Carlson repre uh, spoke about the health care, and it, it, it is much needed in, in small businesses. Give them a health plan they can afford and keep their businesses going. So uh, I think it's a good plan. It's a good start. If other companies would want to come on board, I think uh, eventually we could bring them on. Thank you. Uh, Dram shop, we passed the, uh, with the House made the bill better, I still didn't vote for it, but, but they made the bill better and we passed the dram shop uh, bill. I think, it, uh, I think it's kind of a false promise anyway. Uh, the backfill, one of the areas we don't talk about is school districts. They're affected by this too. And we just seem to jab and jab and jab at school districts and cut, uh, undercut the, every time we, we, we have an opportunity. So, and I certainly would hope we wouldn't do anything in fiscal 19. Cities and counties already certified their budgets. March 15th is the deadline to certify your budget. They've already done that. So that would really, uh, you know, throw a wrench in anything there. So if you're going to do anything, you don't do it till fiscal 20. And I don't think they should do anything. I, I, don't, I think maybe we're under misimpression, but I, I think people thought that this was going to go 10 years on the backfill. I don't think it says that in the bill anywhere, but people got kind of thought that was what the story was, was on them. But, uh, but anyway, uh, you know, maybe we need to refine that. But I don't see cutting the backfill. That just doesn't, you know, the, if cities are, are growing, why penalize cities who are growing? That makes no sense, you know. When most of the state isn't growing, you pass some cities growing, go in and, you know, cut those. So I, I, I would hope they wouldn't do anything on the backfill. Uh, the Wellmark and Farm Bureau thing, it's, it's an end run around the Affordable Care Act because it's not insurance. 
It's not going to be regulated by anyone that I know of. It's not going to be regulated by the insurance commissioner because it's not insurance. It's not insurance, so it gets around the Affordable Care Act. So it's just a, just an operation dealing with Walmart and Farm Bureau, and they talked about getting somebody else involved. That's not what the bill does. It's just Farm Bureau and, and Walmart. And, and the coverage is going to be far less than what's uh, offered by the Affordable Care Act, uh, and it's not insurance. So I just hope that people understand when they're buying this product, it's not insurance. It just pays for a few things. It's still going to have uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, provision of if you have a, uh, something pre-existing condition, uh, th they're gonna, they're gonna, we people have those out and everything. So it's gonna just take care of a, a small group of people, and it's not insurance. So people really need to be aware of that and, and how that's gonna move forward. Yes, and one other thing, they talked about Medi Medicaid. Medicaid is a health insurance program, and it goes to mostly people with disabilities and also uh, poor elderly people. So that's what Medicaid is. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Don Paulson. I live in 76 Township. Uh, yesterday, the Republican leadership announced a public hearing for their tax giveaway plans for this coming Monday at 5 p.m. The Senate Republicans' plan includes $790 million worth of new giveaways for special interests and corporations. Doesn't Iowa need more revenue now, not less? Uh, Don, the public hearing is 5 o'clock on, on Monday, so if anyone wants to come by, it's in the old Supreme Court chamber, so hope we get people out. Well, I think you, well, thanks for that information about the uh, hearing, but I, it's a people's money. I, I, I believe we need to get some money back into their pockets. Uh, I, I don't know why. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that as a state uh, instead of just uh, spending it uh, and not having a real plan and, and keep taxing the, the taxpayers of Iowa. So uh, I, I, I'll be interested in to hear what comes out of this hearing and uh, uh, I don't think the Senate's plan is even in, in going to be in effect. I think you're going to see a whole different plan altogether so I wouldn't get hung up on exactly the what the Senate has for numbers yet. Uh, so uh, it's just a wait and see for us up to get uh, what we're going to do out of the Ways and Means and Appropriations Committees. Yeah, Don, I, I don't, not sure what their public hearing is all about. I, I think Senator Dvorsky is right. We've seems like we've modified a lot of legislation that's come from the Senate this year to get something more in balance from the House side. Um, you know, the issue of why does tax reform come up this year, and, and I've been asked before, is why now? It really has to do with because of the federal tax law changes and Iowa still being one of the states allow federal deductibility. So if you were, you know, if you made $50,000 a year and you paid $10,000 in federal taxes, the first thing you did was when you did your Iowa taxes, you deducted that $10,000 and then you paid Iowa taxes on the 40000 The fact that f the federal tax reform has reduced Iowa taxes, that $10,000, let's say for my example, it's dropped to 8000 So now you got 50000 you deduct the 8000 now you've got 42000 So you have your Iowa taxes now on a higher adjustable gross income so if we don't do anything, Iowans will be paying more income taxes because of the federal tax reform. So there are many of us who believe that the idea of the federal tax reform was not for the state of Iowa to get a tax windfall for that. It is to how can we address the so that you, you know, that it at least stays at, at worst case revenue neutral. So that's the discussions about tax reform, is how do we take those dollars? Now, you're, as most of you know, your tax years don't match up with fiscal years. So it's how much money comes in and when does it come in, and that's the estimates. That's where a lot of the work is trying to be done, is what does that additional income mean and how much do we need to do to get back? But it's somewhere probably in the uh, north of $100 million a year, just even in the first, first full year 
so that's that's what's driving the, the, the discussions about tax reform. Thank you. Just one additional thing. I'm a little worried that we don't have a very good handle on what the feds have done and what the estimates are and everything. So, you know, we don't necessarily have to do anything, you know, in April. We may want to look at it and figure out what, what exactly they have done and how we can go in and deal with it. And, and I, I agree, if, if we don't change anything, it's going to be kind of a tax increase. So the governor's plan, as I understand it, just takes that money, sort of additional funds, and uses that, buys down the rates. So that so that's kind of a reasonable plan. The House is maybe a little bit bigger than that. And the Senate is way out crazy land. So um, I, I think that, that, that uh, hopefully they'll look at those different plans and come up with something. So, but I, I'm not sure we need to move forward. We can always call a special session and do something that when we actually have numbers and really know what's going to happen or what, what has happened at the federal level. And because these are all estimates and they may be way off, you know. And I think uh, to be prudent about it, we might want to look at that as a special session. Maybe the governor will provide some leadership there. This will be our last question. Uh, good morning again. My name is John David from Muscatine, and I don't really have a question. I just a quick comment. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of you because we, as we know, today is the last session for this year. But I would like to stress the fact that uh, with MCC Young Democrats uh, attending every session this semester, it was really a great learning experience for them. So it is important to continue to do that in order for our younger generation to continue to learn more and more from all of us here, those of us who are a part of the political uh, arena or not. So thanks a lot again, and hopefully we'll see you again, all of you, next year. Uh, with the exception, obviously, you know, Senator Dvorsky, thanks a lot for your service again. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Um, that wraps it up. Have a great day. Thank you.